And thank you, Secretary, for being here as well. Pleasure. I want to begin by asking you about the topic on everyone's mind right now. That is the decision back in 2018 to separate families and children, or families rather, at the southern border. Uh, in April of 2018, a memo came before you when you were head of Homeland Security. And it read that if you signed it, you could permissibly direct the separation of parents or legal guardians and minors held in immigrant detention so the parent or legal guardian could be prosecuted. You signed that, allowing for the separation of parents and children at the southern border. Do you regret signing that memo? Yeah, so I think, uh, first of all, I just want to start by saying thank you all for, uh, for having me here. I think these are very important. As we heard just before, there was some controversy, but uh, from my view, these issues are so important that we really need more voices, and we need to be additive and find a way to come together to solve the problem and not work on taking people apart. Um, it's very divisive. It's very emotional. It's very complex. Lives are at stake. Uh, many people have been affected. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the reality is, and we'll talk more about this, and I'll get to your question in two seconds, uh, the system is broken. You know, it, it, the rules, the laws, uh, the facilities were all built during a time when the vast majority of people coming across the border were single uh, males, uh, actually from Mexico. Uh, and so it was very easy to return them. Uh, it was a very short period of time, uh, return them if they didn't have a legal right to stay. But now what we see is 60, over 60% 60 of those traveling here are families, and over 60% of those traveling are from other parts of uh, the south of us, mostly from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. So the flows have changed, uh, but the laws and the facilities have not. So we have a terrible mismatch, and we have a huge need to come together uh, to solve this. With respect to the particular question, there is a lot of confusion about what happened and what didn't happen, and I, I do think it's really important to discuss because the only way we can get to solutions is when we really understand uh, what happened and what the, what the facts are and uh, what worked and what didn't work and what shouldn't have worked and uh, what perhaps could have worked better. Secretary, I apologize. I know my time with you is limited, but to zero, the memo that sure, you endorsed zero, zero in April of 2018. Yeah, so the Attorney General announced zero tolerance. Zero tolerance was the uh, direction that a law be enforced. Uh, there is a law that says it's illegal to come into our country between ports of entry. There's 90 ports of entry, around 90 ports of entry on the southern border. Uh, what I did the entire time I was at Secretary is encourage people to go to the ports because it's much safer. Uh, this is a terrible journey uh, that people take uh, to come here. Uh, outside groups tell us 70% of migrants are victims of violence, 30% of women are raped. We give pregnancy tests to girls as young as 10 so that we can protect them when we receive them. So the decision of zero tolerance was to enforce a law Unfortunately, like everywhere in the United States, there isn't a exclusion for purposes of immigrants. If a parent commits a crime, they go to a custodial setting and their child does not follow them. The idea and the point and the concept of zero tolerance as decided by the Attorney General was not to separate families, it was to enforce a law to encourage people to go to the ports of entry. What happened, though, was out of the 49,000 children that came unaccompanied, meaning they were sent without their parents, there was a percentage of those that was added to that number because their parents went into a prosecutorial setting. So I just want to be very clear as to what, what was decided and what was not decided. We didn't I am, to be clear, yeah. asking you about your decision to sign a memo in April of 2018 yes. that endorsed separating families at the southern border. Right, and it did not. What it did was it said we were going to enforce the law. There was no, to be clear, there is no federal law mandating separation of families. No, there's a federal law that says that it's illegal to cross between ports of entry. That's right. The judge said that yes, it's illegal, and the judge said yes, in the United States we don't send kids to prison or to a custodial setting with their parents. The decision was to enforce the law not to separate families. Any family I think we should be very clear about this. There was a policy change at DOJ that was called zero tolerance that said now everyone crossing the southern border would be prosecuted. In order to do that, they needed children separated from their parents so parents could be prosecuted. In your role as the head of Homeland Security, you had to allow for your agents to separate children from their family. You made that decision in the spring of 2018. 
I'm asking you if you regret making that decision. I don't regret enforcing the law because I took an oath to do that, as did everybody at the Department of Homeland Security. We don't make the laws. We asked Congress to change the law. Congress reviewed the law in 2006 and decided to continue to make it illegal to cross in that manner. What I do wish had worked a lot better is that the coordination and information flow were simply insufficient for that number of people coming. It's heartbreaking that any family felt at any time that they had to cross the border illegally. Because this is a terrible, dangerous journey. It's terrible. So what I regret is that we haven't solved it, and what I regret is that that information flow and coordination to quickly reunite the families was clearly not in place, and that's why the practice was stopped through an executive order. In the lead up to that policy being signed, we know on the other side of, of the government on HHS, where they were responsible for the care and custody of those children, they were raising red flags. They saw the numbers of children coming in, being separated, and said this will cause lifelong trauma and harm to these children. There should not be an official policy to separate children. We now know also in your agency, senior staff raised concerns about civil rights issues and trauma to children. Did anyone in the lead up to you signing off on family separation raise those concerns with you? So everything was, of course, reviewed by the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. It was reviewed by the lawyers. These were the recommendations from the operational entities to enforce the law, because from their perspective, they're law enforcement agents who have taken an oath, and that's their duty. The bigger challenge here is to prevent uh, families from coming that way, because it's extraordinarily dangerous. Uh, so yes, all of those people, if you, if you followed the timeline as well, uh, after the Attorney General made his announcement, we spent a month uh, looking through, trying to make sure that we would do it uh, and enforce the law uh, in the most compassionate way possible. And what I mean by that is if you had children under five, the policy was we would not refer you to prosecution despite the fact that you had broken the law. And despite but we know now that children under five were, in fact, separated from their so families. Some of them were. If you look through the court cases, though, there's other reasons why families are separated. If the adult accompanying them is not a parent, and unfortunately we saw a tremendous increase in fake families of adults, unfortunately, using Secretary, children. but you and I both know that the number of fraudulent families, as they're classified, are statistically insignificant. That's in incorrect. Them crossing That's the border. incorrect. What's the percentage of fraudulent it's families? It's over 500 families, and out of the 49,000 children that HHS had in its care that were unaccompanied, under 2,000 were because of the fact that their parents chose to break the law. The El Paso sector just released numbers that showed of the families that they found to be fraudulent, it's less than 1% of all the families crossing at that time. But that's one of 90 border crossings. That is crossings. one of the most highly trafficked sectors. Right, so 1% still is at a the same time, number. How fair is it to hold up a, sig a statistical insignificant number as a priority for you? Why does that justify family Well, separation? because I think if we, it doesn't, it's not about justifying it. My point is that what we need to be focused on together is trying to stop all of this horror of these families coming in this way. We don't want them to have to go to a smuggler or a trafficker. I guess what I'm saying is one woman who's raped, one child who's exploited is too many. So the system needs to be changed so that they don't have to come that way, which is why, among many other things, I proposed legislation to Congress to allow families and individuals to claim asylum before they ever get to the United States so that they don't have to take this journey, which is so horrible. Did people ever specifically raise to you the concern that children will be traumatized as a result of, as a result of this policy? Not when I was writing, not during that Not moment, directly no. to you. You never heard those concerns? Not from staff, no. I mean, I think it, from a, the biggest... From child welfare experts, yeah, anyone from outside the, biggest, the government. From the biggest... This was nothing new, uh, to be clear. So from a staff perspective, I think, you know, there was this belief that to not enforce the law would encourage trafficking, would encourage child to be, ch children to be used as pawns. And the law enforcement officials had taken an oath, which is why the operational entities recommended that we choose to enforce the law. We never forced it 100%. If you had two parents coming across, we chose specifically not to refer both parents so that one parent could stay with the children. As I said, we did try to limit as much as possible any tender age situation. Uh, but it, wasn't, it clearly wasn't working. So we stopped it during an executive order. Uh, and we have been hopeful uh, that Congress will look at this and really take very seriously what is the best way to do this. I mean, the debate, the debate is very false. We don't have to choose uh, between protecting vulnerable populations and securing the border. That's a false choice. 
We don't have to choose between keeping out opioids and facilitating trade. We can do all of these things at the same time, but they do require changes to the laws. To be clear, the U.S. government is currently not doing everything possible. It's led I, largely I, by I, immigration groups and yeah, by Yeah, I'm, I'm not in the government right now, but I'm also not part of Health and Human Services. You are with the administration right now, though, right? You did accept a I position with the advisory with council. The administration right now. The, the White House put out a press release saying that you had rejoined. No, what the White House did was say that they had asked me as an expert in critical infrastructure and cybersecurity to join CEOs throughout the country as part of an advisory council. None of us are paid. None of us work for the White House. We use our expertise to try to advise government on what we need to do in cyber Understood. and critical You're currently advising the White House. Can I ask what led you to and, resign? And, so, and by the way, so are other CEOs, though. I mean, are you, are you telling every CEO in here that they should never advise the government on how to make something work? I'm interviewing you right now. So I'm asking you, before we turn to questions, what led you to resign from this administration? Uh, what led me to resign is uh, there were a lot of things that uh, there were those in the administration who thought that we should do. And just as I spoke truth to power from the very beginning, uh, it became clear that saying no and refusing to do it myself uh, was not going to be enough. So it was time for me to offer my resignation. That's what I did. Secretary Nelson, thank you for taking the time to answer No problem. I wish we had gotten to cyber because that's why I was originally here, uh, it was for a cyber panel. So let me just quickly say it's Cyber Awareness Month. Uh, cyber is the biggest threat that we face in the homeland today. Uh, it does take each of us to do our part. It's a weakest link problem. Third-party risk is the biggest thing we face. Uh, and as we move towards elections, the other thing I just wanted to say quickly is remember, if you go to vote and for any reason you are not on the voter database, you are guaranteed by right a provisional ballot. Please use it.